the additional Yom Kippur Day offering as described in Numbers chapter 29, verse 7 through 11. The additional Yom Kippur offering as described in Numbers chapter 29, verse 7 through 11. It reads, and you shall have on the 10th day of this seventh month in holy convocation, and you shall afflict your souls. You shall not do any work there, but you shall offer a burnt offering unto Yahweh for a sweet savor, one young bullock, one ram, and seven lambs of the first year. They shall be unto you without blemish, and their meat offering shall be of flour mingled with oil. Three tenth deals to a bullock, and two de tenth deals to one ram, a several tenth deal for one lamb throughout the seven lambs, one kid of the goats for a sin offering beside the sin offering of atonement, and the continual burnt offering, and the meat offering of it, and the drink offering. In uh, verses, verse 11 of chapter 29 of Numbers, it states that uh, this goat offering from, for sin that's instructed in verse 11 is an offering for sin at Yom Kippur. Or this date, this day on the Hebrew calendar, which is the 10th day of the seventh month, which we commemorate tonight, in which we were instructed in verse seven, that we should have a holy convocation or a holy gathering. And that's what we have tonight on the Zoom. It's a day where you afflict yourself. Now, the word to afflict, it actually implies certain things. Historically and traditionally, the implication is that this day is to be a day of 24 hour fasting. And certainly that is one way of afflicting your soul by denying yourself food and water for a 24 hour period, if possible, if you can do it, all right? But there's other ways in which we restrain from our normal comfort zones as well, in addition to just the food and the water. Uh, some of us also understand that Afflicting our soul could mean that we cut down certain of our um, pastimes, C certain of our diversions, like TV, uh, certain things we like to do, enjoy to do, but because of the solemnity of this day, one form of afflicting our soul is not to be engaged in those things. Also, for those of us who are able to, we should, if possible, take this day off from work, if possible, according to verse seven. This is a Shabbat day, a day where, if possible, you shouldn't work. However, sometimes it's not possible. So you have to do what you gotta do for your livelihood. Yah is never going to give you laws and commandments that are burdensome because his laws and commandments are not burdensome. But there's an advantage for your blessing in terms of your ability to focus if you can get that day off. And if you can't, uh, there, there's no indictment against you. But in verses 8, 9, 10, and 11, there's very detailed descriptions of certain ceremonial animal sacrifices that are somewhat mathematical to the measurements and the degree of these uh, items, not only of, of uh, animal products, but also of oil and flour. Uh, and as you review these, these, these aspects of the uh, ceremonial observance of the Yom Kippur, in order that 
you can find some value of interest in this and can glean some real beneficial truth that you can take away from this other than just looking at a at, at the food channel uh, where, where they instruct how they make certain dishes and things of that sort. And uh, I have a dear sweet sister who's been living with me for the last 45 years, uh, Emma Devins. She'll sit up and watch the food channel all day if you let her. She loves to watch how ingredients are put together. And I've heard some of you talk about you like those things. Now, I personally, uh, I'm not a food channel man, but this this is the Yom Kippur food channel right here. Verse okay. seven, verse eight, nine, and 10, giving you the description of the ingredients and the way of cooking them. But if you want to look at this more than just Yah's food channel, and you want to get something beneficial, there's a very serious meaning and purpose for these items. It's so meaningful. It's so purposeful. And, and, and all of these descriptions look very complex. This is that section when somebody said, I want to read the Bible and you want to give them comfort. These, this is definitely not one of those sections that normally we would turn to people and say, well, go to, to Numbers chapter 29 and read verses 8 through 11. You're going to really get comfort from reading about how you chop up the bullock and how you take seven lambs of the first year without blemish and how you take the oils and the, the, the meat of it. Yet, when you really review this, what I'm about to tell you, there is certainly some comfort in these instructions. Because, praise you I stand by. I see Sister Reese coming in. Shalom, Sister Reese. Shalom. Um. That there, there is comfort in these descriptions because the complexity in, in here in Numbers chapter 29, verses 7 through 11, the complexities, the instructions of the ingredients for the, the annual cooking of these items, they're all to illustrate a very important point to Israelites. They're all to illustrate a very important purpose for Yah giving us this instruction. Yah is not just giving this instruction to make us bored. I remember when I first tried to read through the Bible as a young man, I really wanted to dedicate myself to reading through the Bible. I'd done something really bad. The police were coming to arrest me. I was 16 years old. And I said, my life is ruined. And I said, but if you save me and get me out of this predicament, that I'll preach your word. And sure enough, a few minutes later, I got a call and say, everything's okay. The charges are being dropped against you. All right. Now I was a little mischievous 16 year old boy. But what, what I do remember uh, is, is that some, somebody told me, they said, son, if you really wanna do what you claim you wanna do as a man one day, to really be a, a proclaimer of the word, you got to learn to read the Bible. So I said, okay, I'm gonna try to read the Bible all the way through from Genesis to Revelation. I did okay with the stories. I read the stories in Genesis pretty good. And then I read the stories uh, in Exodus up until they started talking about these things, like what we're reading about tonight in Numbers. We're talking about animal sacrifices. And I, I would fall asleep and then I would stop. But that's because you see, growing up in the churches and Christianity, Christianity took away the Hebrew Israelite orientation that our forefathers had about the value and importance of what these items mean. Having lived in Africa and having seen how our people do that back up in the up country that some people over here call the bush. People over there would be offended if you say they live in the bush. But it's back up in the up country, as we would say that. They do certain things and ceremonies when there's times of struggles and troubles. And I remember there was a tribe uh, that I worked among, the Wakamba people. They're Bantu, they're Hebrews. 
They're waking up to the identity as Israelites. That when, when a serious tragedy of some sort would happen, like maybe famine, or maybe some sort of epide epidemic, sickness, I, I always remember that there was a certain tree that even though they went to these churches that I was setting up over there, I was being paid to be a missionary to set up Christian churches for them. But yet I noticed when these really rough, tough times came, they weren't doing those ceremonies inside the church. They went to, to certain trees and they would take certain lambs and they would slaughter those lambs and throw the blood at the base of the tree. Now, a lot of them didn't know where they got that from. And I have a dear friend in Atlanta named Brother Gakuru who's got a wonderful book. I want you all to get it if you can go on Amazon. And it's called, uh, the book is called uh, Bantu Hebrew Israelites Identity Revealed. And as you uh, review it, you'll see they do things there that we had stripped away from us here. But when they would see these instructions like here in uh, this passage, in uh, the book of Numbers, they could understand what this was all about because they were doing certain things traditionally from ancient Israelite culture that they had maintained even though they were in exile in sub-Saharan Africa. For one thing, the first thing they will tell you is the ver by virtue of you seeing these animals and this description as it's explained, this indicates that the people who are instructed to do this ceremony are people dealing with some serious problems in their lives. And that the, the answer and solution to these problems had to be resolved by Yah. They understood this, that the creator is the only one that could resolve it. And they understood that these ceremonies had to be done so that you could have a credible <laughs> presence in sight of the Most High to petition his intervention to help you with a problem. And so when you begin to see these instructions, as we see for the feast days, uh, that have all these intricate details, your ancestors, both when they were in the land of Israel and later when you were scattered through Africa, they did these ceremonies. And in some isolated pockets uh, of Africa, they're still doing them. To find a way to earn Yah's favor oh. because they felt if they're dealing with, say, an epidemic, a famine, that they had done something wrong in Yah's sight. They had done something so wrong that Yah is judging them. They had done something so bad that they felt the only way they could ask him to solve this problem and to heal their land was they had to do a ceremony that Yah would accept as some sort of atonement, which means a covering over of what they did wrong. And that's all that you're gonna see with this instruction. These are ingredients that your ancestors, these are things they did to earn favor with Yah to forgive them because these are people going through the wilderness when they got these instructions. They are having to fight enemies on every side. They're fighting uh, also the, the constant uh, need for food. They, they need water. They're going through the desert. They, they want to be on Yah's good side. And Yah said, well, these, these are some ceremonies I want you to do to be on my good side. Because we can see the ceremonies, and I would tell the people, in some places where well, they were doing these ceremonies way up in the bush and they didn't know what they meant. And I would say, well, you know, what you're doing is something that you and I need to know to be right. That is, you kill that lamb and you smear that blood under a tree. That represents how our Savior Yahshua died on a tree and his blood was shed for you and me at the base of that tree that he hung on when he died for our sins and that all these ceremonies that our ancestors did in Africa before they were caught up and brought to American slavery, 
and the ceremonies that they did when they were in the land of Israel as instructed here in Numbers. These were ceremonies to get on Yah's good side. And on the Day of Atonement, this is, these are ceremonies, these are practices that you are to be aware of. Now, we're not in a position to do these ceremonies now. That to do these ceremonies now, you would need a Levite, uh, which is, we don't have Levites fully activated. You'd have to have a sanctuary, a, a, an altar, and all of those things, or certain things. So uh, in terms of the actual practice of what we're seeing here, uh, this is not something that's functional for us right now. However, what we can do is can we can look at the meaning of it is that it comes down to simply when you sum it up with the complexity of all these details, it's, it's really Yah instructing Israel how they can get on his good side to, to look beyond their faults and to see their need, to forgive them of their sins. And that's what the Day of Atonement is about. It's about a day of reflection on how Yah can forgive Israel as a nation. You see, beloved, we as a people in America, both those of us who are aware that we're Israel and don't, those who don't know, we're all affected by the same problems. We're affected by problems in our community, lack of safety. We're affected with health problems. We're, we're, we're affected with financial problems. All of the curses in Deuteronomy chapter 28 affect us all both the awake Hebrews and the non-awake Hebrews. Sure, there are some of us doing better than others, but when you look at us at, uh, as a whole, basically, we still are wrestling with those seven groups of curses, which involve curses in our families, curses in our neighborhoods, curses in the religion we have, we've been involved with. It doesn't help us. We got we, we, we got a million dollar church on every corner in 10 cent neighborhood. Yeah. Uh, you would think in, in many of our cities with all these churches that these neighborhoods should be just so blessed, but they're just getting worse. And even the churches are closing up. So, so we, had, we were cursed with ineffective understanding of the spirituality that works for us as a people. Uh, fourth, we have high mortality rates. That's another curse found in Deuteronomy 28. That is uh, death. Uh, we have high mortality rates with abortions. Uh, then non-abortion uh, deaths of babies coming into the world is high among us. We, we have violence and, and other mayhem that gives us as a people the shortest lifespan by any people in America. Uh, also, we have those financial issues and problems that make us very needy and desperate for resources uh, and, and opportunities financially, economically. And I could go on and on about these seven groups of curses. Also oppression. Don't let anybody convince you that you're not an oppressed person in America. You and I, most of us have lived long enough to see and know, whereas they're trying to paint the picture that, that there's no more oppression to us since slavery. You and I know working in the work world we're in, the favoritism, the white privilege, and various other aspects of this society. Like for instance, all the years I worked as a chaplain, I never forget that if a group of Gentiles could say something bad about me, to me, then they could be witnesses against me. But as soon as I would return and say something back to them, they would go and run and tell my supervisor, I get a call from my supervisor. And I said, and the supervisor was one of them. I said, well, we can't win for losing here. And, and, and so never accept the lie that you're not under oppression just because 
you living better than say your ancestors did a hundred years ago. But you'll find, as some of us later find out, that some of us under the illusion of inclusion that that somehow we we're not oppressed anymore. And then the rude awakening comes. It happens to us all. And so with all of those seven groups of curses, what we're reading about tonight of the sacraments were important because for our forefathers on the Day of Atonement, this was an opportunity for us to get right with Yah that, he, that, that, that we collectively, now individually, we always should be praying for forgiveness every day, but collectively to come together as a nation, really ask him to bless us as a nation. Uh, this, this is what these ceremony sacraments were for. So, so that uh, these, these uh, aspects of how they did this as described here fit very closely to some ceremonies that I saw among our people in Africa that are waking up among tribes in Africa like, like the Yoruba, the Igbo, uh, the Kikuyu, the Wakamba tribes uh, as the uh, Baluya and various other Bantu tribes, the Limba. By the way, when you do your DNA through my true ancestry, just by all of you, your, your DNA will, even though you, your ancestors were primarily snatched from West Africa, most of your DNA will end up matching closest though with tribes in Africa that acknowledge themselves as Israel. That, that's a fact. And likewise, when they do their DNA, they'll find their closest relatives are African-Americans. I'm talking about the ones that you come closest to. How that works out, I don't know why Limba, who have known to be Israelites, or even the Tutsi tribe in uh, Rwanda, why they end up being so close to us, there's many different thoughts about it, but the fact of the matter is prophetically, not just genetically, we are the people of the book, the Jews and Israel. And we have to understand every part of this book to understand how to be right with Yah. And when we come to these sections like this section, as I tended to do, we would read past all of those details so we'd get to the good parts. You know, like he... You know, he loves a cheerful giver or, he, or <clears throat> good parts. All things work together for good. But I'm, I'm, my challenge to you tonight is I want you to see how verse eight were, or, 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 or verse seven or verse 10, where he talked about these animal sacrifices, why and how. That's something that's good for you to know about too, because really these are intricate details of how Yah is illustrating to us the path of atonement and forgiveness. Because you see, Israel's number one problem is sin. It's sin. Until Israel gets right with Yah on its sin issues, no matter what it does, it doesn't solve the problem that we have, which is the curses, which are the result of sin. Because sin, according to 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, is the transgression of the law. And so what today, Yom Kippur is about us looking at ways of getting on Yah's good side to overcoming the transgression of the laws and the commandments of the Most High. And these ceremonies very much harmonize with our forefathers out of Africa. Now, uh, to continue on with this process, Um, there, there are other instructions about the Day of Atonement as well, found in chapter 16 of uh, Leviticus. And so the other uh, sin atonement sacrifice that's described there in Leviticus chapter 16, verse 5 through 10, says this, and he, that's the priest, he shall take of the congregation of the children of Israel two goats for sin offering, one ram for burnt offering, and Aaron shall offer his bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, and make an atonement for himself and for his house. And he shall take the two goats 
and present them before Yah at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aharon shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the lamp, for the most high, the other lot for the scapegoat. And Aharon shall bring the goat upon which the lots, Yah's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before Yah to make an atonement with him to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. So again, these are all intricate details illustrating some great truth that you and I can take comfort in in that there's a ceremonial sacrifice that, that resolves the crisis of sin in our lives as individuals and as a nation that can gain for us favor before Yah. Yeah, see, one day, uh, Zachariah the prophet said that this day of atonement is going to be turned from a day of sadness to a day of joy, because that'll be at a time when the kingdom blessings of Yah through Yahshua will be implemented upon us. And these ceremonies and sacrifices, they all simply reveal something about the sacrifice of Yahshua, just like I, I had the opportunity to explain to our people in Africa, when I saw them slaughtering a goat and throwing its blood up at the base of the tree as they face towards Mount Kilimanjaro. And yet we know when we face the east and pray towards Jerusalem and beg Yah's favor and pardon, the scriptures say Yah will hear. And when we confess our faults, Yahshua is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us by his blood, which he shed for you and me on the tree when he died and presented all the, the, the benefits of atonement for the Israelites to be right with Yah. See, without Yahshua, Israel doesn't have any atonement with Yah. That's why all these intricate ceremonies were done. These are all tributes to the coming sacrifice of Yahshua. They never were meant to be the actual fulfillment of righteousness before Yah. They were to be tributes for in the time of Moses, these were tributes looking forward to what Yah would do through his only begotten son, Yahshua, to save Israel from its sin. And in the future, when these sacrifices are resumed, because they will be resumed, in the day, particularly in the day of the kingdom, we'll see their function, they will be tributes looking back at what Yahshua did for us. So these ceremonies are nothing but tributes to honor and to commemorate the value of redemption and forgiveness through the blood of Yahshua. But in winding this up, why do we have these two instructions for, the, for sacrifices on the day of atonement? You got the instruction in chapter 29 of the of numbers, then you got the instructions for the sacrifices in Leviticus chapter 16, verse five through 11. So the instruction in numbers, this additional instruction, what is the significance of that? I, I believe it's important because before you can have a sacrifice or a means of reconciling with Yah, He always wants a sin offering for love and forgiveness among the Israelites, which is the primary meaning of the additional Yom Kippur offering in Numbers 29, verse 7 through 11. For example, Yahshua the Messiah taught his disciples in Matthew chapter 5, verse 23 through 24. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and thou rememberest that thy brother have ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. So it is um, imperative among Israelites, as, as we come together for Yom Kippur tonight, as we enter into reconciliation and forgiveness with Yah, Yah requires that we first reconcile and forgive one another. See, we can't as a people 
have so much hatred and unforgiveness for each other and then turn to him to forgive us and expect him to forgive us when we don't forgive one another. First John chapter four, verse 20 through 21 states, if a man say, I love Elohim and hate of his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he have seen, how can he love Elohim whom he have not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth Elohim love his brother also. So as we focus this Yom Kippur for the mercy and forgiveness of Yah, we should also focus on forgiving and seeking forgiveness from our fellow Israelites who may have offended us or whom we have offended. The Cain and Abel account is, is an example. Cain and Abel is an example of a relationship gone bad, which had negative consequences for Cain's relationship with the Heavenly Father. As a result, Yah would not accept Cain's sacrifice because his heart, Cain's heart was not right with his brother, uh, or Cain's heart was, was not right with his brother Abel. First John chapter three, verse 11 and 11 states, for this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Verse 12, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one and slew his brother, and wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. So, and so as we enter into Yom Kippur, we must remember that this observance, of course, is for the purpose of being in right relationship with our Heavenly Father. But it also, this observance is also to make us right in relationship with one another as well. This is why the additional sacrifice of Yom Kippur in Numbers 29, 7 through 11 accompanies the Yom Kippur sacrifice in Leviticus 16, 5 through 11. Because our credibility in seeking Yah's forgiveness is based on our credibility in forgiving one another. Torah teaches in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, that we should not bear a grudge against one another. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, verse 18. But thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, I am Yah. So as we focus on Yah's forgiveness on this most solemn day of atonement, let us focus on being cleansed and healed from old wounds and hurts done by others to us and pray for our forgiveness of them. Yeshua said in Mark eleven twenty five, 25, these words that we should take into account is Yom Kippur, verse 25. And when you stand praying, forgive, if you have aught against any, that your father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. Hallelujah, amen. Father, Yah, bless your people to forgive one another and to heal us and to cleanse us from hatred 